in January of 2022, I issue a challenge to all of you. I challenge you to start working on your careers. Specifically, I challenge you to grow your skills as a developer by working on projects on GitHub. This allows employers to see what you can do and it allows you to start working with others in the industry. Now that it's been three full months, I want to drop in on five projects to point out the great things that they're doing. Now, if you don't know me, my name is Tim Corey and my goal is to make learning C Sharp easier. I do that by providing videos here on YouTube multiple times per week. Plus I have a weekly podcast. I also provide courses on C Sharp, web development, and much more at IamTimCorey.com. The profits from those sales are what pays for the free content here on YouTube so that everyone can have a great education in C Sharp, not just those who can afford it. So let's jump right into the project today. And we're gonna start by looking back at this video. If you haven't already seen this video, I'd encourage you to go check it out. I'll have the link down in the description, but this is the C Sharp project challenge. And in here, I challenged you to do a few things. One, to jump on Twitter. It's the place that a lot of technical stuff goes on. So jump on there so you can see new stuff, interact with your peers, and start building that network of people that you know that you can interact with and help out and also get help from. Also, I encourage you to have a LinkedIn profile, something you can show employers and so that others can find you and see what you're good at and, and maybe find a fit for you somewhere in the industry. And third, I challenge you to build something, just any small thing that fills a need and do it on GitHub so that you can show off what you can do in C Sharp. It will also allow others to work with you and it will allow you to work with others as well. So that's the challenge. And if you go to Twitter, you'll see that we have a, um, a hashtag, hashtag a C Sharp challenge. You'll find in here tweets from a lot of different people who are participating in this challenge. So I've picked out five different um, GitHub repositories that I wanted to look at. Now, there's lots in here that we could cover. And if I don't cover yours, don't think it's because I didn't like it or something like that. I just couldn't get to everybody. But I did pick out five. I want to highlight some different things that I found in each. So let's start off first with Steve's. Now, the, the first cool thing I like about Steve's is right here, we have a build and test manager and it says it's passing. This is an automated test that makes sure that when he checks in code or when code gets checked in, that it passes a bunch of tests. So great there, I like that. Also, this is very, very important and it's done very well. There is a very clear description of what this code does. This is often overlooked. And it's something that when you overlook it, your repository often gets overlooked because if you don't clearly state the problem and how your code solves that problem, then people don't know why the code exists. Yes, it's in your mind, but if it's not in their mind, they don't understand. So in this case, this application connects with GitHub lists your repositories and allows you to select multiple repositories for deletion. That's it. So it deletes multiple repositories on command. So basically it's a cleanup tool for your GitHub. That's all it is, which sounds super simple. And yet at the same time, it's not, there's a lot to it. There's a lot of work and Steve is still working through all the work that has to go into making this work, but this solves a clear problem and it states it in a way that's understandable. So I really like the, the description here that shows exactly what is going on here. This right here is a key part to any repository. Also notice it's one sentence. It's not a paragraph. It's not multiple paragraphs. It's very clear, concise, and short. Because if it's lots and lots of paragraphs, I'm not reading it. I'm skimming over it and I probably won't understand it. So well done there, Steve. I really like that. Next up, we're gonna look here at Pierre's. Again, very clear description. 
Windows application convert between metric, US, Imperial, and other units. It's exactly what it does. Very clear, very understandable, and we all need unit conversion at some point in our lives because we have it all standardized on metric, unfortunately, but that's very, very clear. And so it, it makes me understand right away what this is all about. Now, also in here, we have a version history. Now, version history is very, very important to an application because it allows for a couple things. First of all, it shows progress. It shows the application is being developed actively, but it also shows what has changed. One of the things that I use a lot is Camtasia. And every once in a while, Camtasia will tell me, I have a new update and ask me to download it. The very first thing I do is I go to the change log and I find out what are the changes between my version and the version that they want to give me. So if my version is 0004 and they say we have 0007 for you, I'm going to read all these and see what has changed. And with that detail, it allows me to understand what's going on. Now, in this case, it's probably too much information just because the fact that we don't need everything here, but that's because uh, Pierre is in the early stages of making this. And so the early stages are a lot of changes and it's, it's good to have, Hey, these are the changes I'm making in this spot. Now, as he goes further into this, I would like to see it, it shortened down to, uh, maybe the, the revision version, the, uh, or even the minor version, um, changes only so that there's a little bit more, uh, preciseness to it, a little bit less, a more high level look at the change log. But for right now, this is good because it gives you a clear overview of the things that are rapidly changing. So really great there to have a version history. Lastly here, I really like this. If you want to contribute to this repository, which is greatly appreciated. If you do, here's how you do it. This is really helpful, especially in industry that often kind of excludes people who aren't in the know. The, the assumption that, well, everyone knows this and no, they don't. So by giving a very clear, here's how to help, here's how to contribute. Well, then it makes it a whole lot easier for a person to actually contribute. So here are the five steps to create a pull request for this repository. Excellent. I love it. Even has examples that say exactly how to do this. Well done. I really like that. That will really be helpful for others that want to jump in and help. And the cool thing here is this is generic enough that if you want to contribute to a different repository, you can still use probably those same steps. So even if you don't end up contributing to this particular repository, come check these steps out and learn from them so you can contribute elsewhere as well. So well done, Pierre. I really like that. Okay. Next up, Kevin, this one's pretty cool. Kevin, I believe is actually working with his daughter. If I remember right from his tweet and this project, um, is, is an interesting one because the fact that if you notice it's been three months since I issued a challenge in those three months, there have been 82 commits three months. It's about 90 days plus or minus. That's a lot of commits for three months. And in fact, if you look at the history, they're pretty regular. March 26th, March 25th, March 24th, 23rd, 22nd, 21st, 19th, and so on. So there is a consistency here. That's really great. Now, Kevin and his daughter are doing more than most. Really. This consistency is amazing. It's really well done. And maybe not everyone can do this, but showing this consistency allows an employer to look at this and go, this person doesn't give up. This person isn't going to start working on something and get tired of it and walk away. This person has 
the stamina to go the distance. Well done, Kevin and your daughter. Um, this is great. Hopefully you can continue to work on this and get this up and running. But either way, I think it's a great experience. And it's one that hopefully is teaching a lot along the way. So well done. I really love that. All right, Sean Mark. So this one right here is the mass property calculator. The, the thing I wanted to highlight here, um, there's some good stuff here. It's a roadmap here. Pretty cool stuff. Limitations and warnings. This was interesting. If your application might have some problems or might cause some problems, it's great to call that out. So saying, hey, I have not tested this in this particular scenario, which recursive process, that could be a problem. It could, you know, continue to run your computer and maybe even just kind of lock it up. So it's important to call that out and say, hey, just be careful. We're not there yet. This is pre-production code. This is not production code. So if you know of a potential pitfall, great to show that off. But I also want to show off this as well. If you notice dot github slash issue template, and you'll see this bug underscore report dot MD. What is this? Well, this is a, a way to tell GitHub how to uh, allow users to submit issues. So if we go over here to the issues tab and I say new issue and I say, let's get started. Notice right here, describe the bug, a clear and concise description of what the bug is. Steps to reproduce. And then it kind of gives you, leads you down a path of, okay, go to, click on this, scroll down to this error. Like it, it's walking to the path of showing how to document the re, how to reproduce an error. Explain what you think should happen. Include screenshots. Give me additional context. This stuff is really important. I can't tell you the number of times that I've had help tickets, issues, and others that come through that say, I have a problem and that's it. Well, I can't help you because even if you say I'm getting an error, well, that's not enough information. But if you follow these steps and fill in this error report, the much higher likelihood that it can be replicated, it can be identified and it can be fixed. It makes the issue more usable. So it's excellent to have something like this in your repository to say, Hey, this is how you issue a bug. This is what you should do because that way it just makes your life easier as the, as the owner. And it makes the, the issue easier to fix, which makes the, the person who submitted the issue happier because the bug goes away faster. So it's in everyone's best interest to have a clear issue report. And this shows you how to do it. Excellent job. And finally, Theodore with his work tracker, um, again, very clear on the description. So what it does, how it does it, and what it's there for. Very good job there. Another thing I like about this is the installation steps. So it's all right to the spot where you can install it. Not everybody's stuff is at that spot yet, which is why not everyone should have installation steps yet. In fact, a lot of repositories I saw said things like installation, not yet, which is great. That that's actually really good to communicate. We're not ready for this yet. This is pre-production code, but when you're ready, when it's even to the point of getting even, you know, pre alpha, but it can just work well, have installation steps. So in this case, there's very clear installation steps, one through four with good documentation, even pointing to a guide here for setting up Azure Active Application and so on. So very good job with clear installation steps. Now, I do wanna point one thing out here that I think will make every repository here better when it's time. Now, a lot of these repositories are, like I said, pre-alpha, definitely not uh, ready to go. But as you're trying to explain what your application does, a picture is worth a thousand words. So when you have your very clear statement, 
one of the other things you can do is have a couple of pictures that really demonstrate what your application can do. Or if you have the capability, create a small GIF. And yes, I said GIF, not GIF. It's not a peanut butter, it's GIF. Sorry. Um, anyways, cr create something small that shows off your application. So in this issue, I know it's issue number six here. If you scroll down, you'll see very clear screenshots of what the application looks like. Now these are a little wide. You might be able to shrink it down a little bit, maybe if you want to zoom in a little bit, but this shows exactly what the application looks like and where it's at. Okay. So you have your employer list, you have your work for that employer and you have your invoice page. So that kind of stuff, if you put that in your readme, it makes it even more clear what your application or what your, your code does. Now, not every bit of code has clear screenshot ability. Some code just doesn't work that way. But when you can, it's great to show off what your code can do. And maybe if your code's a library, show off a couple of the commands and talk about what they, what they do. Okay. But picture worth a thousand words. All right. So those are the repositories I wanted to highlight. I'm going to put the links to all of these down in the description. So go check them out. Give them a star. Contribute possibly if, if that makes sense. Either way, encourage them. And if you've kind of fallen behind, if you started this and haven't kept up, get back in the groove. Don't worry about falling behind. Worry about getting back in the groove and keep going. Okay. This is about making progress, not about being perfect. And if you've not seen the challenge yet, again, go back to the description. There's a link to the original challenge. It's not too late. Start today, start tomorrow. The goal here is to move your software development skills forward and also show off what you can do. Okay. So that's what we're trying to do this year is hone those skills, but really show off those skills as well so that you can point to these things with a future employer and say, this is what I can do and show exactly who you are as a developer. All right. I can't wait to see what you do. Keep working on it. We'll keep checking back in on these things. And I'm going to talk more about open source development and really just how to work with these types of products in the future. All right. Until then, thanks for watching. And as always, I am Tim Corey.